Welcome everyone, good morning. We are happy to start the winter school this year. We have, a, I think, a very exciting program. I'm looking forward to hear it. Let me start with a few uh, formal uh, announcements. Here we will be just today. For all other days, we will be in the main auditorium, which is just across the hall right there. This is the big place where the Higgs was announced, so you will probably recognize it. Uh, the coffee breaks will be outside here. And importantly, the, the end of every uh, day, at uh, six, <laughs> at five, we will have here a discussion. And all the lectures are coming here, and you can ask them more questions to elaborate on what was discussed. The idea is not to uh, more progress in the lecture, but to clarify more issues that were maybe no time in the lecture, and so on. And uh, today, at six, after the discussion se uh, section, we'll have a reception outside right here. Uh, we'll start with uh, David Simon Duffen, who will tell us about CFT and Lorentzian signature. We'll have a uh, first talk today. Okay. Thank you. Can I use this to turn off the projector? Thanks. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, back at CERN. So uh, in these lectures, I'm going to be talking about some uh, recent developments in analytic conformal bootstrap methods. Um, and um, one, of, one of these most interesting developments um, was the introduction by uh, Simone Karen Ho of a Lorenzian inversion formula. And these uh, lectures are going to be um, centered to some extent around the inversion formula. Uh, I'm going to start by trying to introduce the necessary elements to understand what the inversion formula actually is. And I'll say a few words about why it's interesting and uh, give an example application, which is to the light cone bootstrap. Um, and then my main goal for the second half of the lectures is to um, prove the Lorenzian in inversion formula, but do it in um, uh, a way that um, I think makes more manifest what's going on. What is the underlying structure that the inversion formula is telling us about? Uh, and so that will um, lead to the introduction of light ray operators and a particular way of proving the Lorentzian inversion formula that um, makes very clear the role of light ray operators. And then um, if there's time, and I'm not sure there will be time, I want to give a, 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 an interesting um, uh, example application of light ray operators um, that is uh, currently work in progress. Uh, okay, so uh, before getting to uh, um, getting to all of this, uh, let me review the conformal bootstrap, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time in Euclidean signature. And part of the power of these tools is that they don't just work directly in Lorentzian signature and analyze what. Uh, um, conformal representation theory tells us in Lorentzian signature, they connect Euclidean and Lorentzian signature. So we're going to start in Euclidean signature and then understand how to wick rotate in a very informative way. Okay, so let me start by uh, reviewing the conformal bootstrap. Um, and so our starting point will be a four-point function of primary operators in a CFT. And for simplicity, I'll take them to be identical scalars. So for the most part, when I write phi, I'm thinking of it as a scalar. And when I write O, I'm thinking of it as an, a general operator with, uh, with some spin j. Um, and this four-point function has a conformal block decomposition. And so the conformal block decomposition is what happens if you evaluate the four-point function in radial quantization. And you insert a projector onto a particular conformal multiplet. So here, this is a projector um, onto the multiplet of O of some operator O. And what it, that means in practice is it's a projector onto the states O and then derivatives of O, descendants of O, 
and so on. Um, and so uh, when you insert these projectors, then conformal symmetry completely fixes uh, the form of this function. Um, and the thing that you get is called a conformal block. So it's a sum over O. Um, I'll say O in the phi phi OPE of some coefficients, which are not fixed by conformal symmetry, times a function that is fixed by conformal symmetry. Um, and uh, this function is called a conformal block. Um, and it depends on uh, the dimensions of the external operators, phi appearing in the four-point function, and it depends on the dimension uh, delta and spin j of the multiplet O that you're projecting onto. Um, and it depends on the four space-time positions. And the dependence on the space-time positions is actually further constrained by conformal symmetry. So that it's actually equal to some standard dimensionful factors. Times a function of cross ratios alone. Um, and these conformal cross ratios are uh, conformal invariants built from the positions of the four points. And uh, you have to write them down in every bootstrap lecture. So it's standard to define uh, u, which is this combination of, of distances. And that's equal to z, z bar. And then v is the same combination with 1 and 3 swapped. And that's equal to 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. Um, so you plug in the distances. And then from these equations, you can solve for z and z bar. And the claim is that the conformal block is up to these factors, just a function of z and z bar. Um, OK, and then uh, another fact that we'll need about um, conformal blocks is um, some information about uh, how to compute them. And um, the main, uh, one of the main properties that will be interesting is that they satisfy a differential equation. Which says that the quadratic Casimir of the conformal group um, acts on the conformal block with a particular eigenvalue. So here, this is a differential operator <laughs> whose form we won't need explicitly, but um, it gives the action of the quadratic Casimir of the conformal group, which is SOD plus 1, 1. So remember, uh, remember, we're going to be in Euclidean signature for a little bit. So the quadratic Casimir of the conformal group um, uh, acting on uh, points 1 and 2. So that's what these uh, indices down here represent, uh, d1, 2. So the idea is that um, we have our four-point function. We have these four operators. We're singling out two of the operators, and we're acting with the quadratic Casimir on these operators. So that's going to give us some kind of linear combination of uh, movements of these two operators while we're keeping these operators fixed. Um, and um, when we move these operators simultaneously using conformal generators, that's the same as acting with the conformal generators on the internal operator that is appearing in the conformal block decomposition. And that's why um, we get this eigenvalue equation. It's because the quadratic Casimir acts with a single eigenvalue on all of the states in that uh, internal multiplet. Um, and this eigenvalue is uh, explicitly delta times uh, delta minus d plus j times j plus d minus 2. Um, and this is almost enough information to, deter to actually determine what the conformal block is. The last piece of information that we need uh, to completely fix this function is a boundary condition. So we have a differential equation. Now we just need a boundary condition. 
And the, conform the boundary condition for the conformal block um, is that at small z and z bar, it behaves like uh, zz bar to the delta over 2 times a function of angle, which happens to be a Geigenbauer polynomial. OK, so um, uh, so these are uh, standard um, uh, results from the conformal bootstrap. And they just come from taking this four-point function, uh, essentially inserting a complete set of states, and analyzing the full consequences of conformal symmetry. Are there any questions? All right, so um, we won't need to know a lot about these functions, these conformal blocks. So the conformal blocks are known explicitly in terms of elementary functions in even space-time dimensions. Um, they are not known in terms of elementary functions in uh, odd dimensions. But there are lots of things that are known about them. And uh, we'll mostly be able to get along with, um, uh, with without seeing explicit forms for the full functions. Um, and one of the most important. Um, yes, that's right. Yeah, so the, this thing, this is C2. This is, the, um, this is the eigenvalue of the quadratic Casimir in this representation. So this thing is determined by taking the CJ. Oh, this thing. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, it is. So that, that's a good question. So actually, I'm already indicating that here. Um, so the, dependent, the delta phi dependence of the conformal block is actually entirely in this prefactor. Um, and that's true in the case of identical operators. So if we had non-identical operators, there would be some, some delta phi dependence in here, too. Um, so I like to write, I like this notation because it will allow us to generalize to the case of non-identical operators later. Um, this fact that this function doesn't depend on delta phi is a special thing for identical operators. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Other questions? So there's no dimension dependence? Dimension dependence. Oh, space-time dimension. Yes, they definitely depend on the space-time dimension. Um, that's right. Uh, so, so they depend on the space-time dimension in two places. One is through the actual eigenvalue of the Casimir, and the other is through the form of this differential operator, which I'm failing to write down. Um, uh, there's uh, there's d-dependence in both of those things, and it means the conformal blocks are different in different space-time dimensions. Yes. Um, in terms of the uh, quadratic Casimir equation, it's something kind of similar to the difference, differences uh, between wave equations in different, uh, different space dimensions. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in even dimensions, the equation can be shown to factorize um, into uh, a sum of two one-dimensional differential operators, and in odd dimensions, it simply doesn't. No, no, it's, it's always a local differential operator. It's just that, in principle, it's quite complicated because it acts on both. So what you do is you take this equation, and you plug in this expression, and you get a differential operator in terms of z and z bar. So it's a two-variable second-order differential operator. Um, and it's actually it's kind of magical that, uh, it, that after a change of variables, you can make it factorize um, in even dimensions. It just simply doesn't happen in, in general dimensions. Okay. General, I think when you ask a question, please press here that we all hear it, and then press again to stop it. Great. There was another question back there? Yes. Um, so my question is, uh, based on this eigen uh, state that this is decomposed in terms of delta and j, so that means that your g delta should also be decomposable. But if, if I want to see that in real space, does that mean that I decompose G in terms of R and then angular like uh, coordinates? Um, let's see. Yes. So, so this is a projector onto an entire multiplet. So it's a sum of, um, it's a sum of terms 
where you plug in these. So my notation is maybe a little funny. So I can write this projector a little more explicitly. The projector is equal to a sum over a pair of descendant states of that descendant states divided by, roughly speaking, divided by the norm of those states. So this is still a sort of schematic expression. Um, so it's a sum. It does, the conformal block doesn't completely factorize. But you asked about radial versus angular dependence. And, uh, and that, that is an interesting story. So you can take these states and classify them according to their uh, radial eigenvalue, which would be delta, and their angular eigenvalue, um, and plug those in. And then you get, you, you get that the different, sorry, I should have had a, written a dot, dot, dot here. This is an example of the kind of term that you get. So this comes from a particular state with a certain radial eigenvalue, eigenvalue under dilatation that leads to this term, and a certain eigenvalue under changes of, uh, of under rotation, and that leads to this Geigenbarrow polynomial. And then the, the dot, dot, dot will be contributions of states with other eigenvalues under those generators. Okay. Um, so yeah, I should have written dot, dot, dot. And um, this dot, dot, dot represents higher order terms in, um, in z and z bar. Okay. Other questions? Okay, good. Um, so the one thing that we will need about conformal blocks, and I'll go ahead and erase this, um, is uh, how they behave in so-called light cone limit. Um, and to understand that, you can take the differential equation, which I haven't written explicitly, and um, take uh, a certain limit um, and solve the differential equation in that limit. And you find that, uh, so this, the light cone limit is in the limit um, where z is much less than z bar. Um, in that limit, the conformal blocks behave, uh, in, in all space-time dimensions, behave like some power of z um, times a hypergeometric function of z bar. So this is plus higher order in, in z. And this hypergeometric function is one that will show up a lot. Uh, it's a 2 of 1 hypergeometric function with these particular arguments. Um, and the reason it shows up, um, uh, and the reason it shows up in, in any spacetime dimension is because it's a conformal block associated with a subgroup of the conformal group associated with the SL2R subgroup that fixes a light like line. Um, and I'll talk more about that later when we actually need this formula. Um, but this is just about the only thing that we'll need about um, the actual form of the conformal blocks. Um, and then, of course, the starting point for the conformal bootstrap from all of this stuff is to write down the conformal block decomposition of a four-point function in two different ways. So we argued that um, the four-point function can be, after stripping off some dimensional full factors, can be written as a sum like this. Um, and that came from pairing up the operators in a particular way. So we paired up one and two, and three and four, and inserted a projector between those. But we could have paired them up in a different way. And then we would get a, a, uh, an ostensibly different expression for the same four-point function. And those two expressions have to be equal to each other. And this gives the crossing symmetry equation. So the crossing sim statement of crossing symmetry is that the conformal block decomposition uh, in one way of doing the decomposition, so this is um, uh, 1, 2 goes to 3, 4, um, is the same as what we would get if we um, swapped uh, 1 and 3. Now, uh, when we do that, um, when we write down that equation, we have some dimensionful factors out front. We can multiply through by those and rewrite what we get in terms of z and z bar. And that's the uh, factor that I've written here, because I'm just going to try to write this formula in terms of z and z bar alone. 
So it says that the conformal block decomposition in one channel is the same as the conformal block decomposition in a different channel. Where uh, essentially z uh, and 1 minus z have been swapped with each other. So I'll refer to this side as the S channel, and this side of the equation as the T channel. Um, and this is an extremely powerful equation that relates all the OPE coefficients and the scaling dimensions of the theory in some, in some complicated way. Yes. Uh, sorry, but uh, I got lost when you were explaining how do you, do you how you got to that uh, to that last equality. Um, yeah, good. So what you do is you start with the the conformal block decomposition, which has these dimensionful factors in it. So on one side you have these dimensionful factors. On the other side you have the same thing with one and three swapped. And then you multiply through by these factors and rewrite the ratio of the factors in terms of cross ratios. So this thing comes from x12 squared, x34 squared over x13 squared, or x14 squared, x23 squared to the delta phi. That's what this thing in parentheses is. Other questions? Okay. Um, good. So uh, what we're going to do now is introduce another way of writing the four-point function that is closely related to the conformal block decomposition. Um, but uh, it will allow us to package together the data appearing in the conformal block decomposition in a slightly more efficient way. And this more efficient packaging is necessary for writing down the Lorenzian inversion formula. Um, and the machinery that um, uh, will let us do this is harmonic analysis. Um, and again, we're still in Euclidean signatures, so this is going to be harmonic analysis for SOD plus 1, 1. Um, and um, essentially, what harmonic analysis uh, for the Euclidean conformal group tells us is that whenever you have an object that transforms under the Euclidean conformal group, it can be decomposed into things that transform in very special type of representation of the conformal group, uh, known as the principal series representation. So we always have some kind of decomposition in principal series representations. Um, and I should add, uh, there, there are other representations that can in principle appear, so the so-called discrete series. Um, but uh, those will not play a role in uh, what we're doing, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So um, they could, in principle, be there, but they're not going to be interesting for us. The interesting things for us are principal series representations. Um, and these principal series representations, I'll write them as curly E delta J. These are representations um, of uh, operators um, with dimension delta and spin J. Um, where delta has this funny value, d over 2 plus i s, where s is real. Um, so these scaling dimensions um, uh, that appear in principal series representations are not appropriate for physical states in a CFT. We know that physical states in a CFT have real scaling dimensions. And not only that, the scaling dimensions um, have to be positive. They have to be bigger than some uh, basic uh, um, uh, unitarity bounds. All of that comes from the underlying unitarity of the CFT. And these principal series representations are not unitary in the sense that we care about for, um, uh, for conformal field theory. Um, 
Uh, they're unitary in a different sense. Um, basically, they're unitary with respect to a different real form of the conformal group. Um, and the, but the fact that they can't possibly be physical representations of a CFT is not going to bother us too much because we're going to use them as just mathematical tools. So you should think of these principal series representations as being kind of analogous to plane waves. The idea is that if you have any function um, of position, you could consider its Fourier transform, which is uh, writing the function as a linear combination of plane waves. And that's a helpful thing to do when you're thinking about translation invariance, uh, regardless of what the form of the function is. So these principal series representations will sort of play a similar role to plane waves uh, in what we're doing. And the relationship between them and the actual physical representations of the CFT uh, will become clear in a little bit. Okay? So these are, these are mathematical tools, and, uh, and we're going to um, be uh, working with these funny unphysical scaling dimensions, but we'll see how they're related to physical scaling dimensions later. Okay? Um, so, uh, so one of the most important things about these principal series representations um, is that uh, there's an equivalence between principal, seri a principal series representation um, and its so-called shadow representation. So here, delta tilde will always mean d minus delta. And by equivalence of representations, what I mean is that there is a, a conformally invariant linear map, um, invertible uh, linear map between these representations um, called the shadow transform. Um, so the idea is that, um, so I'll call it SE, E is for Euclidean. So the shadow transform acting on some operator is an integral transform where uh, you take that operator and you integrate against the two-point function in a conformally invariant way. So we can write a two-point function And the two-point function is completely fixed by conformal invariance. And so now I'm introducing some uh, other notation that I'm going to use throughout these lectures, which is that um, when I write two- and three-point functions, I generally don't mean physical, uh, physical correlators in a CFT. What I mean is the unique um, uh, structure, the unique function of positions um, that's fixed by conformal invariance and transforms in the same way as these operators inside the function. So this notation here, uh, when O is a scalar, literally just means 1 over x minus x prime to the 2 delta O. Um, and in this case, delta, it's delta O tilde. So the representation here, appearing here is this so-called shadow representation, O tilde, which is uh, a representation with the same spin as O, but where the dimension is swapped, um, uh, where we have dimension delta tilde. So when I write two and three point functions, I often just mean these types of formulas. Okay? I'll try to be clear about that when I write them down, but that's going to be a convention that I'll use a lot. So um, uh, the point of doing this is that um, the product of these three factors, um, together they transform like a dimension zero scalar. So let me rewrite them again. So under, under conformal transformation, um, O picks up some uh, factor that depends on its dimension. So under conformal transformation, O picks up some factor omega, which comes from the rescaling of the metric to the delta. Um, o tilde picks up the same rescaling factor to the d minus delta. And then this thing uh, has mass dimension minus d. So this picks up a factor omega to the minus d. So uh, overall, um, uh, under rescaling, this thing is invariant. Um, 
And so uh, it transforms like a dimension zero scalar, and that means it can be integrated in a conformally invariant way. So um, because all of these dimensions add up in the right way, this is a conformally invariant um, integral. Um, and not only is it a conformally invariant integral, but if you start, if you start with something that transforms uh, with dimension delta and spin j, the thing it spits out, and you should check this for yourself, is something that transforms with dimension d minus delta and spin j. So this gives a conformally invariant uh, linear map between a representation with dimension delta and a representation with dimension d minus delta. And the role of the principal series representations is that if delta has this nice value, then these integral transforms will tend to converge in, uh, in the correlation functions that we'll write down. Um, and uh, so in order for this uh, conformally invariant linear map to exist, um, it must be the case that the quadratic Casimir eigenvalue is independent under delta goes to d minus delta. And in fact, it is. So I, I just erased this formula, but I'll write it again. So it was delta times delta minus d plus j times j plus d minus 2. And this is, in fact, invariant under delta goes to d minus delta. Um, and you can also write down the quartic Casimir. There's an interesting quartic Casimir for uh, SOD plus 1, 1. Um, involves, uh, it's a quartic polynomial in delta and j, um, and it is also invariant under this uh, uh, change of quantum numbers. Yes? Good. So um, C2 is the quadratic Casimir of the conformal group. So this is the quadratic Casimir. Very explicitly, it's given by taking the conformal generators um, uh, and summing over all of them, summing over a product of all of them. There's typically a minus 1 half in this formula. Um, and you act on a state in some multiplet. Um, and C2 is the eigenvalue that you get back. And the quartic Casimir is defined similarly. Other questions? Yes? Um, maybe a little not mathematical, but uh, can you associate some physics to that S value in delta in your decomposition? Associate some what? Some, some physical meaning. Like the, the first part is like half of the dimension, space-time dimension. But then the, the second half, I, S. Oh, this. Yeah. Some physical meaning to this. Yeah, I was just wondering. Yeah. So, so this is analogous to the statement that in Fourier analysis, um, when so the idea with Fourier analysis is we take a function and we decompose it into irreducible representations of translations. Now, there, uh, it's easy to write down uh, uh, an irrep of translations. Any exponential. Um, uh, transforms into one dimensional representation of the translation group. Because you take an exponential, you translate it, and you get a multiplicative factor. Um, but when you do Fourier analysis, not any old exponential appears. You don't have growing exponentials or dying exponentials. It's only oscillating exponentials that appear. That is, e to the i kx, where k is real. Um, and um, uh, the reason that happens is that um, uh, um, harmonic analysis uh, tells us that um, a function that transforms under translations can always be decomposed into a very particular set of representations of translations. They're so-called, um, uh, uh, they're, they're always unitary, irreducible representations, and they also satisfy an additional technical requirement that they're called tempered representations. So, which essentially means that their matrix elements are sufficiently nice. So it's only certain representations that appear. Um, and uh, it turns out that for, her, for uh, the conformal group, it's these types of representations that appear. These are the things that are analogous to plane waves. Other representations are analogous to growing and dying exponentials. How about discrete 
Um, well, good. So I don't know a good uh, analogy for discrete representations. Um, um, that's right. So all, always te only tempered representations will appear. Good. So I haven't explained that yet, um, but um, I'll explain it in just a little bit. Well, I won't explain it very well, but I'll quote the theorem that is relevant. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, okay. So, good. So the statement of harmonic analysis, again, is that um, these particular representations are special because they give us some kind of complete basis for decomposing things that transform under the conformal group. So let's look at something that transforms uh, under the conformal group and apply a harmonic analysis to it. So we're going to consider a correlation function. Um, with uh, uh, two operators, phi, one, uh, phi, phi x1 and phi x2, and um, then a bunch of other operators. And in this analysis, it won't be important what these other operators are. It also won't be important that they're primary operators. So this could be any linear combinations of descendants of any operators you want. And we're going to focus on how this correlation function behaves as a function of x1 and x2. And um, harmonic analysis tells us that if we look at how this function behaves as we uh, act on x1 and x2 with conformal generators, then we can decompose that into principal series representations. Um, and what that means um, is that this uh, correlator um, can be written uh, in, in a particular, as a particular sum over principal series representations. So now I'm going to introduce uh, some other, uh, another convention that I'll use a lot. Um, so you remember that I said that when I write uh, a two-point function here, I really I just mean a function that's fixed by conformal invariance. Um, so uh, um, when I write two and three-point functions, that's usually what I'll mean. Um, and if I want to talk about a physical correlation function in a physical CFT, then I'll write an omega subscript on that correlation function. The omega is supposed to indicate the expectation value in the physical vacuum. OK? So this is, this is not fixed by conformal invariance. This is some interesting correlator. It could be, it could be the endpoint function in the 3D icing model or n equals 4 superior mills or whatever. And uh, the statement of harmonic analysis is that this can be written as uh, a sum over principal series representations, which means a sum over spins and an integral over dimensions. And the integral over dimensions runs over just these uh, funny complex dimensions that appear. There's a factor uh, mu of delta j that I'll explain in a second. Um, and then, uh, and then a partial wave associated to this principal series representation. Um, and then that times a three-point function. So here I'm again using this notation. So here this, this is a three-point function, um, and it doesn't have an omega subscript. So what this means is it's the unique conformally invariant function of these three positions, x, x1, and x2, um, that transforms like a three-point function of two scalars and an operator with dimension d minus delta and spin j. So this, uh, this function is unique. And if you like, I can write it down um, in a second. Okay, so um, uh, the claim is that the endpoint correlation function can be written in this way, um, and um, uh, these each of these terms gives essentially an eigenspace of this correlation function, 
with respect to the uh, Casimirs of the conformal group acting on 1 and 2. The reason is that if we hit, let's say we hit both sides of this equation with respect to the Casimir of the conformal group acting on 1 and 2. Then um, on this side, uh, it hits this three-point function. And if we act with these two guys on, with conformal generators, because the three-point function is conformal invariant, it's the same as acting on this thing with a conformal generator. And the quadratic Casimir of this thing is just that eigenfunction, th this eigenvalue over here. So each of these, uh, each of these terms is an eigenspace of the conformal Casimir. Um, and so now let me write down what this uh, P actually is. So this is equal to some factor that, again, I'll explain in a second. times an integral of our correlation function. Times another uh, conformally invariant three-point function. Um, and uh, I like to draw pictures um, for these formulas because they often you can do calculations just using pictures. Um, so the idea is that um, with this partial wave, uh, we start with this endpoint function. And you can think of the endpoint function as being like a blob with n lines coming out of it. And these are lines one and two. And uh, we contract it with a three-point function. And um, I like to draw three-point functions as a vertex with three lines. Um, so here's a three-point function. Um, and this three-point function has two shadow operators. And so shadow operators I'll draw as incoming arrows to the three-point function. And shadow operator just means that they transform uh, with dimension d minus delta phi and d minus delta phi. And then there's an outgoing error, arrow here that transforms like O, which has dimension delta and spin j. So this thing is a graphical representation of this partial wave. Um, and uh, the statement of these two equations is that, so what we did here is we took this endpoint function and we basically projected it onto a particular representation by integrating it against the three-point function. Yeah, I'll explain that in a second. So I haven't explained this, and I haven't explained this. So I'll, I'll say what those are in a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, um, that's a great question. So for most of this lecture, I'm taking the simplified case where the two phi's are the same, but similar formulas exist even when they're not the same. Yes? So, so, um, so far we're just talking about um, we're just talking about functions, and there's um, what I mean by omega here is that this could be some function that where that comes from a physical CFT, for example. But it's really just any function of these points. So someone computes this and gives it to you, and you don't know where it comes from. Um, and so this thing this thing appears in two places. It appears uh, it appears here. And because it appears here, it means that p, in pr p actually depends on this whole function. And so um, p depends on the whole function. And um, basically, these two uh, equations are inverse to each other. So the actual physical function that appears is, is, is hidden in p here, and it appears explicitly here. So the, the statement that we, uh, this, the statement that we're looking at here in these two equations is that 
if we compute the partial wave by contracting two of these lines with a three-point structure, and then we furthermore take this uh, and, and contract with another three-point structure, and then we uh, sum over j and integrate over delta, then this thing is equal to the endpoint structure that we started with. So um, I guess I just wrote these two equations in reverse. So um, so this top this top equation is uh, is that one is a graphical representation of that one, and this other equation is a graphical representation of that one. Okay. Um, so uh, next, I want to explain what these factors are. And um, they're not going to be too important for us, um, but uh, um, they're important objects in harmonic analysis in general, so I think it's a good idea to mention them. Um, so, uh, let me start, uh, I'll, I'll just start with this one. Um, so, we saw that there is this nice conformally invariant um, type of integral that we can write whenever we have an operator and its shadow present. Um, so, this is a natural pairing between uh, a, an operator and its shadow representation. Um, and this gives you a way of pairing um, uh, endpoint correlation structures that involve shadow operators. And this pairing has an E subscript for Euclidean. And this is defined by just taking the product of these correlation functions and integrating over all the points. Um, but there's uh, a problem with, uh, with this expression. Um, and um, does any, any guesses what the problem is? Could be divergent, could be divergent right. And so why, why, why is it divergent? Why could it be divergent? Pardon? Dimension. Dimension. Um, Good. So that's that's a good point. So the, this whole thing uh, together is invariant under rescaling, um, and so you could have a divergence just from rescaling all the positions. You have to integrate over the scale of all of the positions, and that gives a divergence. It's actually worse than that. By construction, this is invariant under any conformal transformation, um, because the products of each of these are. Uh, because this measure times operator times shadow is invariant under conformal transformation. The endpoint correlation functions are invariant under simultaneous conformal transformations of all the points. So if I simultaneously apply a conformal transformation to all the points, the integrand times measure is invariant. And so um, uh, we have a problem because the conformal group um, is non-compact. So the way to fix this is to divide by the volume of the conformal group. So we divide infinity by infinity, and we get something nice. And we're physicists, so we know what this means. We, we're remaining calm. Um, what it means to divide by the volume of uh, a non-compact group is that, in practice, the integral is defined by gauge fixing and applying the Fidiev pop-up procedure. So this gives a natural uh, conformal invariant pairing between these kinds of structures. And the thing that's appearing here is the inverse 
of this pairing applied to these three-point structures. Um, and uh, this might seem a little abstract, so uh, what I want to do, uh, uh, what I'll do now is just compute this for you to um, emphasize that, it, that it's uh, uh, not, not too scary. Um, so, um, and uh, this, uh, good, okay, so the idea is, so let's look at this three-point pairing. Uh, let's look at this pairing between structures in the case of a three, of a three-point function. Um, I guess the, well, okay. Um, yeah. I guess I called this one tilde. So the idea, again, is that the, uh, this is defined by um, gauge fixing and uh, supplying the appropriate, appropriate Fidib Popov determinant. So um, uh, what gauge fixing means is that we can use conformal transformations to fix um, these uh, three positions to anything we want. So we can fix them in the classic configuration where one operator is at zero, the other operator is at one in some coordinates, um, and the other operator is at infinity. Okay? So um, this is, uh, so this gauge fixing gives the, uh, the first correlation function evaluated at zero, some unit vector e, and then the last one at infinity, and then times um, the same thing. Um, and um, uh, so we don't have any integrals to do. We were able to use conformal invariance to completely fix all the positions, so there's nothing to integrate over. So we just have a number. If we had started with four-point functions, then we would have some integrals left over. But here we just have a number. Um, and uh, we're, not, we're not quite done, because um, this gauge fixing that we chose only partially fixes the gauge group. So when you fix these uh, three points at positions 0, e, and infinity, there's a leftover uh, gauge symmetry in the integral, which is uh, rotations around the line through these points. And that's an SO d minus 1 worth of rotations. And so we need to divide by the volume of SO d minus 1. Um, and then there's another uh, um, uh, factor that comes in, which is the Fidiv Popov determinant for this gauge fixing. Um, and I don't actually know a quick argument for what this is. Um, uh, you can compute it, um, and it turns out to be 2 to the d. Okay, so this is the answer for the three-point pairing, and then what you do here is you take the standard conformally invariant three-point functions, and you just evaluate them in these kinematics. So for example, when O is a scalar, Um, this factor just gives one. Uh, each of these factors just give one. When O is not a scalar and O has spin, then you end up with some tensor here and some tensor here, and you just have to contract them. Okay? So, um, so that's this factor appearing here. Um, and then finally, the factor appearing here um, uh, is um, uh, this is uh, something special to the uh, group that we're working with. This is the so-called Plancherel measure. For SO uh, d plus 1, 1. Um, and it's, uh, it has some. Um, well, so the Planchereau measure, I'll just say briefly what it is. So the idea is that the Planchereau measure associated with some representation is essentially a regularized trace uh, of the identity in that representation. So it's a regularized version of the dimension of the representation. So it's a trace of the identity in that representation, but this is an infinite dimensional representation, so we should be really worried about this expression. And the thing that you're supposed to do to fix it is, again, divide by the volume of the group. 
Um, and when you take infinity and divide by infinity, this time it doesn't actually work. You have some leftover infinities. Um, so there's a 2 pi delta of 0 appearing here. Um, and uh, so this is sort of what mu means in quotes. I guess I wrote it as mu of delta comma j. Um, and uh, so this is a kind of formal expression. You'll basically just have to trust me that mu is a kind of regularized version of the dimension of the representation. And you can compute it. And it just has some explicit formula in terms of gamma functions, gamma functions of deltas and j's. So there's some gamma of delta minus d over 2, blah, 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 over other gamma functions. OK. Um, and I'm happy to explain more about this um, uh, offline. The actual formula here isn't really going to matter for us. OK. Uh, no, um, no, I, I, I mean it like this. So the idea is that. Um, this group is too big. It has an extra a non-compact factor in it. it, it yes? So sorry, it looks that for s equals 0, this gamma is divergent, and then so it's gamma of 0? Um, for s equals 0, this is gamma of a, uh, yeah, that's right. That's true. Um, yeah, there are. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's right. So, so the, the fact that this factor is divergent shouldn't necessarily scare you because uh, you have to wonder about the behavior of the partial waves um, if you want to actually see how this integral behaves. But you're right. I think that's true. Other questions? Yes. In some sense, they resolve the resolution of identities, which is something that looks like you're inserting here. So, what space is there a natural thing like this is not all of V, or is it all of V, or is it V mod some subgroup? Great. So, the statement is that um, uh, any function on the group, so any, any, uh, so the space is G. Um, so in the case of, of uh, Fourier analysis, if we have a function of position, the idea is to think of that position as being the translation group itself. So we have a function of the translation group. And that can be decomposed into particular representations. The way this comes about is that if you have a function on the conformal group, then it can be decomposed in a particular way. So what, what's happening underneath here is that you take this correlation function and you interpret it as a function on the conformal group, where the conformal group element takes these two points and moves them simultaneously. That gives you a function on the group. And then you apply these um, powerful theorems to that function on the group and unwind a little bit and end up with these statements. OK. So um, I can understand, by the way, if, uh, these, uh, if this part of the lectures is leading to some uh, unease, um, because I'm really using these, uh, um, I'm using harmonic analysis as a black box. I'm not explaining where these formulas come from. And I apologize for that. Um, it's because I want to get farther than just these formulas. So unfortunately, I'm just going to have to take these as mathematical results that we're, um, that we're then going to use. Okay. Um, so I apologize for that. I'm going to try to be a little more hands-on uh, for the rest of the lectures. Okay. Um, so, um, so let's apply this machinery to a four-point function of primaries, um, and that will involve just specializing these formulas that we have. And uh, And by doing that, we'll finally get to 
the point where we can write down the statement of the Lorenzian inversion formula. So we're just going to take the case where we have a four-point function. Um, so the partial wave now is a function of uh, three positions. Um, it's equal to this, this factor times an integral over x1 and x2 of our four-point function. integrated against a conformally invariant three-point structure. For simplicity, I'm going to suppress the spin indices of O. So you can think of O as being spin J, and in that case, it carries some indices, and, and the partial wave does too. Um, and the nice thing that happens in the case of a four-point function is that, um, uh, is that um, this conformally invariant integral of a four-point function against a three-point function, it only depends on three points, depends on x, x3, and x4. Um, so it's fixed by conformal invariance up to a constant. Conformal invariance tells us that this integral has to transform like a conformal three-point function, but conformal three-point functions are, are fixed by conformal invariance. So we just get some constant here, i of delta j, um, times the only thing that can appear um, from conformal invariance. So that's a three-point function um, involving the, uh, these representations. So um, the partial wave in this case uh, has some uh, very simple position dependence, and all the interesting stuff in it is captured in this function of delta and j. Um, and so now we can take this formula and uh, plug it in here and get another expression for our four-point function. The statement is that this four-point function is a sum over j integral over delta over this principal series. of the Planchard measure times i of delta j times something that I'll call psi um, and Um, yeah, I'm being a little sloppy here. I mean, P depends, P, um, P depends on this entire physical four-point function. Uh, no, so, well, I would say this I depends on the whole function here. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, maybe if I wanted to be completely explicit, I would say that I has a superscript, which is like the entire physical four-point function. Um, okay, and this thing psi is just what we get um, when we integrate two three-point functions against each other. And this integral uses, again, our conformally invariant integral, where we have an operator times its shadow times this measure. Um, and in terms of our graphical notation, this is, we have a three-point function with two external phi's and a shadow O. And we're contracting it with another three-point function, where contracting means integrating.
So this is an alternative um, representation of the four-point function. And the thing I want to do with my uh, negative five minutes um, is explain the relationship between this way of writing the four-point function and the one that uh, I started with, the conformal block decomposition. Um, so the idea is that um, this thing, which is sometimes also call, called a conformal partial wave, um, is a solution to the conformal Casimir equation. The reason it's a solution to the conformal Casimir equation is because if we hit this guy with the Casimir acting on points one and two simultaneously, then the Casimir hits this three-point function. But again, when the Casimir, when, when a conformal generator acts on, acts on these two points, it's the same as the generator acting on this point, up to a minus sign because this is conformally invariant. So the Casimir acting on these two points is the same as Casimir acting on this thing. And that gets one eigenvalue, one in the same eigenvalue, which is the one I've been uh, writing a few times already. So this thing is an eigenfunction of the conformal Casimir equation. Um, and um, uh, so it's almost like a conformal block. Um, the only difference that is that uh, it satisfies, it has a different boundary condition than the conformal block. So you remember the conformal block I said was determined by the fact that it was an eigenfunction of the Casimir equation with a particular boundary condition. Um, it, and um, in this case, if you, if you can figure out what this thing is by studying what happens when x1 approaches x2 in this integral. And when you do that, you find that this is um, actually a sum of two conformal blocks with some coefficients. So I'll call these coefficient k. Um, so there's a conformal block. Um, well, that didn't work very well. Uh, there's a conformal block, and then there's the conformal block associated with the shadow representation. Um, And so we're almost at the conformal block decomposition. Um, let me write the function k for you. So k delta j is equal to pi the d over 2 gamma of delta plus j minus 1 gamma of delta tilde plus j over 2 squared over gamma of delta minus 1, gamma of d minus delta plus j, gamma of delta plus j over 2 squared. Um, by the way, if you like offline, I'm very happy to explain where all of these factors come from and how you actually do these computations. Um, and so, um, OK. And then the, the last thing that we'll need is that um, this function i has a symmetry where i of delta j is equal to i of delta tilde j. Um, intuitively, what this just expresses is the fact that um, uh, the, representation, the principal series representation and its shadow are equivalent. So they sort of contain the same information. Um, and the way you actually prove this equation is just by taking this one here, uh, this equation, and applying the shadow transform to both sides. So on, uh, on uh, here, we apply the shadow transform. Maybe I'll use a different color. We apply the shadow transform to this object. And here we apply the shadow transform to this object. When we shadow transform a three-point function, we get some gamma function factors. Those turn out to be the same gamma function factors on both sides, so they cancel, and we just end up with this statement. So I encourage you to check that, uh, uh, check that yourself a little more carefully. But again, this is just the, the equivalence of the uh, representation uh, and its shadow. Um, and what this means is that um, we can, uh, take this expression for the partial wave. So this expression has some kind of shadow symmetry 
where delta goes to d minus delta. And this has some kind of shadow symmetry. And it turns out the Planck-Scherl measure does too. So it means that, um, uh, it means that this, uh, all, the product of all of these terms um, can be written as some thing plus the same thing with delta replaced by the shadow delta. And that means that we can extend uh, the integral to run over the entire imaginary axis, not just from uh, not just half of the imaginary axis. So we end up with the statement that the four-point function is equal to a sum over j um, integral now over the entire imaginary axis, d over two minus i infinity, d over two plus i infinity, uh, d delta over two pi i times c of delta j g delta j, where this factor is equal to mu of delta j, i of delta j, k delta tilde j. Um, and so then, finally, the way to get to the conformal block decomposition from this thing is that, um, so these, these factors are just fixed by conformal symmetry, but this factor has basically all the dynamical information of the theory in it. Um, so C delta J has a bunch of dynamical information in it. And um, you should imagine that C of delta J has poles where the residues of those poles are three-point functions, and the positions of the poles are scaling dimensions. Um, and then what you can do is take this expression. It's an integral over delta over the principal series. Um, but the C of delta J has poles in it on the real axis. So you can take this principal series contour and deform it to run around those poles. Um, and when you do, you pick up the residue of each pole. And that brings us back to the conformal block decomposition. So the idea is that um, all of the data appearing in the conformal block decomposition, the three-point coefficients and the physical operator dimensions, can be packaged together into this one function, C of delta j. Um, and that packaging is very powerful because now we can talk about C of delta j and learn something about the entire spectrum of operators inside the four-point function. Th this C of delta j, in practice, is some extremely interesting uh, function. Um, for uh, n equals 4 super Young mills, it has in it um, all the operator dimensions and all the three-point coefficients of the theory, which means it has in it the solution to the three-body problem, uh, you know, the, in ADS, the, the n-body problem. It has galactic dynamics in ADS, all sorts of interesting stuff packaged into that one function. So um, there, it, knowing this one function um, exactly would, would be a, a tremendous amount of information. Of course, we're not going to be able to do that in a non-trivial higher dimensional CFT, but um, we'll be able to make lots of interesting statements about this function. Okay. Um, so that was the uh, goal of this first lecture. Um, any questions? So yes. Yeah, good. So, so um, you're uh, rightfully bringing up uh, an important technicality that I um, that I glossed over, which is that um, in order to write this expression, the four-point function needs to be sufficiently nice. And in this case, the 
the temperedness condition, so temperedness is like a, a way of saying, temperedness means normalizable. It's a certain type of normalizability. The temperedness condition that you need on the four point function for this statement is some kind of temperedness condition in Euclidean space that usually doesn't actually hold for physical four point functions. So what you really need to do to write, to actually write down this decomposition is you need to take the physical four point function and subtract off the non normalizable pieces. Um, and uh, so, for example, the unit operator gives a non-normalizable contribution to this uh, four-point function. So um, uh, I'll try to write a more explicit formula um, a little bit later. Um, so there's that. So that temperedness, the, this Euclidean temperedness, as far as I know, is not related in a simple way to the Lorenzian temperedness that you're talking about. So the, the um, fact that Lorenzian correlators are tempered distributions um, is a, has a very different flavor to this, kind of, to this kind of thing. That has to do with what happens when you integrate Lorenzian correlators against test functions in Lorenzian space. Here we're integrating in Euclidean space, and so we have, to, we have these uh, coincident point singularities in Euclidean space that, we, that cannot be resolved in the same way that singularities in Lorenzian signature are resolved. So, so in other words, so temperedness, normalizability, these are definitely things we have to worry about in the case of this formula, and it means that to actually write this formula down and for the case of interesting correlators, we need to do some subtraction before using harmonic analysis to decompose the remaining part in, in this way. Okay. Given the time, let's postpone question to the okay. discussion section. Great. Thanks.